Hey, today we're gonna to talk about power outages, pond predators, and aquatic plants. So I just got back from Northern California. We went on a little business trip up there and uh, I wanna tell you a couple of stories. Uh, first of all, I visited a couple people, I visited a pond store, but before I was on my way home, I was sitting in the hotel and I was trying to catch up on emails and questions and so forth and I get this email from a Bao Tran and I watched the email pop up, I checked it out. He was upset because he thought his pond wasn't functioning right, he think he made mistakes and uh, he's not sure what to do about it and he gives me a brief description and it was, it was pretty short. So I sent him an email immediately and I said, where are you located? I had no idea where in the world he might be and he sends me back an email immediately. It's almost like we were texting but via email on the computer. He says, I'm in San Jose and I, text, I, I emailed him back, I'm in Fremont. And uh, I says, uh, hey, I'm going home tomorrow. Why don't you shoot me your address and I'll see about stopping by tomorrow morning and I'll take a look at your pond. So this is a really interesting thing because I mean, literally he's 20 minutes from where I was sitting in my hotel room. So the next morning I go out to Bao's place and I check out his pond and I have to tell you his pond was fantastic, super outstanding. It was a real inspiration to me. It's very formal, it's above ground, half up and half in. He did a great job on the whole thing and I think he just he's a little overstocked with fish and he, um, he had just had some little routine maintenance things that he was kind of not, not getting right and I just gave him a couple of pointers and I'm, I'm really optimistic that he's gonna have a fantastic success with a couple of little pointers that I got. He was actually thinking about filling it in when I got there. I was like, do not fill this pond in, it is really fantastic. So um, a big high five to Bao Tran for doing a really great job on his pond. And I wanna, if you wanna mark your calendar, I'm gonna be back up in Northern California on June 13th, June 12th and 13th. We're doing a little contractor event and a retail event at Connie's Pond and Garden in Castro Valley. It's a great store. Uh, I would highly encourage you to try and make it out to the event and meet me there and tell me that you've seen our Ask the Pond Digger show. It'll be really fun for me. But let's get on to the questions. The first question is from Sissy Murphy. And I know her name comes up a lot on this show. And I guess I found out that her father, when she was a young girl, used to call her the question girl because she's always asking questions. And she continues to ask really good questions. She, uh, she suffered a long power outage at her place. And so she, hadn't, she didn't have any circulation in her pond. And she was a little nervous about it and just got her thinking like, hey, when is this gonna be a problem? Now, uh, at the time of filming this, it's still winter where she's at. So the, the water temperature's low. Uh, they were in the 60s, you know, 60 degrees was the water temperature. So when the water temperature gets really high, that's when the oxygen levels start to drop in, in the, the dissolved oxygen levels in the water. So it becomes dangerous when a, you're overstocked if you have too many fish in the pond sucking up that oxygen. And if the water temperature is warm, I'll give you an example, uh, in, in July, like 4th of July weekend, everyone's going away. If we have any problems with power outage uh, in a pond locally here in Southern California when it's 100 degrees, it is very problematic. So um, in the winter, you don't have to worry quite as much, but let me give you a couple pointers. If you can get a little battery powered air pump, you know, it's a little bit of air, it's not a lot, but you can drop in a battery powered air pump and get a little bit of stimulation of the water column. If uh, it's like emergency status, what I would recommend that you do is you turn on your hose and you make it like rain, you spray it. Like imagine squirting that water in the air and it rains down onto the pond and when all that water starts to pound the surface of the water, it starts to get the oxygen exchange and that's how you can immediately, immediately put oxygen into that water. Uh, if you're gonna do it for very long, of course, you probably wanna put in some dechlorinator depending on you know, how your city water is and so forth, but I think that's, that's like an immediate thing to do. Of course, getting a generator and plugging in your air pump. You know, if, if your life support system is down, that's one thing, but air is the most critical thing when you have a power outage. So 
we do get a lot of phone calls saying, hey, they're going to cut our power from you know 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And that's when I say you better just go get a generator if it's in the summer. In the winter, I'm not so worried about it. So I hope that answers your questions about power outages and gives you some, some feel for that. The next question I'm gonna move on to is about pond predators. It's from Brett Ferguson from YouTube. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty good thing. He, he loves koi and um, you know he's learning the stress signals of, so, uh, of things. And he wants to make his pond less vulnerable to the blue heron and the egrets because I guess he has a, a water passageway or a, a, a green belt behind him and the, the herons and, and um, egrets are hanging out there all the time. So I'll tell you there's the, the things that I've seen. A lot of people say statues work really well of a blue heron. You know, you can move that move the statue around so it doesn't say, hey, that's obviously a statue, that same blue heron hasn't moved. Some people use alligator things. And there's not many alligators in California. It might work for you in Florida. I think the animals are a little bit smarter than you might think. So if you're in Florida, you put some alligator stuff around the pond, might keep them away, but not in California. I think they're on to you. Um, I know, I remember this one time, there was a kind of a courtyard and he was having a problem with herons and he strung piano wire up pretty high in like this cross hatch pattern. And you didn't really see it because the way that the yard was designed and there's a lot of trees and so forth. But that piano wire that he stretched really tight around there kept the birds from com coming in. You see, if, if you have a cover over the pond, the bird, when the bird might land over here and walk under the cover, but as soon as you come up on them, they're very scared, so they want to take off and go straight up. So they're 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 not likely to hang out under a cover because they don't they can't just take off. If if you have no cover, then they can just swoop right away. So a cover is really good. There's a motion sensor sprinkler device called a scarecrow, and they work really well. Uh, the biggest problem I see with scarecrows is you got to change the batteries. You got to stay on top of that. And if the pond's very big, you might need two or three scarecrows to manage the pond. I do have a pond on our service route that is about, oh, it's probably 30 feet long. And we have three scarecrows on there positioned at different areas. So if the bird comes in, it'll, it'll blast them with a, a blast of, of water. Probably the best thing I can advise you on is if you have a dog. If you have a dog that patrols the backyard, then the bird's really not gonna hang out. And I know that's not for everyone, but that's probably the best thing you can do. Or maybe the best thing you can do is a combination of all the things, maybe some piano wire, maybe some kind of cover, have the motion sensor and have a dog, and then you're, you're probably pretty good. Of course, um, the blue heron specifically, they are professionals at catching ugly brown fish in dirty green water. So when you have a beautiful crystal clear pond with these amazing colorful fish, they are subject, so you should um, take some of these things and work them into your plan to protect your pond from pond predators. We're gonna move on to the final question. It is from Ricardo Lamelli. I think I said that right. And he wants to know what's the best aquatic plants that he can use in his bog filter to remove nitrates in the pond. So what I wanna tell you is we want aquatic plants that grow very fast. Rapid growth is what is gonna consume those nitrates. If they're growing fast, that means they're pulling nutrients from the pond. So think along those lines. Um, Louisiana iris, pickerel, uh, a lot of the low growing plants like let's say pennywort. I know pennywort's a very fast growing invasive plant. You don't want it to get into your lawn. You don't want it to get into your garden on the outside. But if you have it controlled in a bog filter where it can grow very fast and you can thin it out as it starts to take over in certain areas very easily, it's a fantastic plant for consuming nitrates in a bog filter. So as I said, pennywort, parrot's feather and things like that. One plant that I think is, is highly underused even by my, my own self, my own company, we don't use this plant enough, is the lotus. Now, a lotus is a fantastic plant for consuming nutrients in a pond. And I'm gonna pause there while I talk about lotus because I cannot talk about lotus without thinking about a very good friend of mine, Kelly Billing. She's out of Maryland, and I just opened this last night. I wanna show you this cool little gift she sent me. This is, these are lotus uh, petals, petals or leaves, I should say and they've expired and so she cut them out and made this beautiful pattern with it and she's colored them and they're on canvas. So I'll be hanging this on my wall. I think it's really a great gift. Thank you very much for that, Kelly. And um, I wanna tell you something else about Kelly. <clears throat> We're gonna have her a guest 
on one of our tutorial series this summer. So we're super excited about that. I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do. We're bringing her out there to, to show you her qualifications. She's co-author of a book. She's been doing, specializing in Lotus as long as I've been in the business. I mean, she's really dedicated to this. She even has uh, her, her company is, is called after the genus, uh, Nalumbo. I think that's how you say it, if, if I remember right. That's the genus of, of the Lotus. And uh, so her, her company is called that, AKA The Lotus. And so we're bringing her out here to Southern California and we're gonna film some different types of ways that you can introduce um, lotus, uh, lotus bogs to an existing pond. We're gonna do a specialty tutorial video on you know, how to do a bog garden or just maybe only a lotus bog. And we're gonna go step by step and show you the tutorial. And it's really fun for me because she's gonna come out there and it's gonna help me grow my, my lotus knowledge and I'm super excited about that. So I'm gonna to end today with the question of the day for you guys on what do you wanna learn about the lotus from Kelly? She's gonna be here in a couple short months. And if you put down your questions about Lotus into the YouTube comments section down below, we'll do the best to compile them all and work very hard to make sure we answer the questions in that tutorial cities, in the, in the tutorial videos, okay? So that's it for today. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thanks for watching.